folks, uh, blessed to be here. Lily just got back from overseas. Uh, we were over there in uh, southern Sudan and Uganda working with our chaplains and also the uh, Ugandan pastors, and we had a great uh, turnout. Uh, in this morning and sharing with you, it really hasn't been that long since we've been here, but I, I recognize there's always some new people, and if I start to jump into the middle of something, they're not going to understand if I don't give a little bit of an explanation. Uh, for those of you who were not here, guys, when Afghanistan collapsed a little over two years ago, <clears throat> we had a real problem in our ministry. We had 22 people in the underground in Afghanistan with their extended families. There were over 200 people. And I got a call from our Dutch office, and they said, um, they're all going to be killed for their faith. And so we put together operations, and I sent in two teams simultaneously uh, into Afghanistan, going into the Afghan mountains. And what we're looking for is a rat line. A rat line is an escape route on how to get people out of a country. And uh, guys, could you put this picture up on the wall here so they can see it? Um, let's get a second here. Wait for that picture. Well, as soon as the picture comes up, we'll show you. But uh, what we've got is a picture of just a few of the passport photos, uh, about 150 of the over 2,003 people that we have now extracted out of Afghanistan. And guys, we're continuing to do it. <clears throat> uh, the biggest problem we are having, guys, right now isn't that we can't get them out. We can get them out. But all the countries we were taking them to are now closing the doors to allowing any new refugees to come in. Uh, if they were Islamic people, and 63% of the people that we got out of Afghanistan were Christians, uh, the others were mostly people that had worked with the U.S. government or women and children that were very vulnerable uh, because the Taliban was coming in and taking widows and splitting them up with their daughters and giving them to Taliban soldiers. And it was a very harsh situation of what was going on over there. Uh, but we still do have ongoing operations. Uh, people that were from Islamic faith, we'd move them into Pakistan or Iran because uh, it was better than at least Afghanistan. But Christians went to Brazil, South America, other places like that. So please pray. Uh, they have started rounding up all the believers in uh, Pakistan and they're sending them back to Afghanistan right now. And it is a death sentence, folks, if you get sent back there. Uh, we've had a lot of strange requests over this last year. I, I would say it's the year of the most greatest spiritual warfare that we've ever had, but I think it's the year that we've had more fruit than we've ever had also. Uh, you know, guys, one of the families that we got out of Afghanistan, uh, they had a 12-year-old daughter that was raped right in front of them. Matter of fact, Taliban came in, and they were in their living room, and they brought in a Taliban soldier, and right in front of her parents, she was raped in front of them, and then she was given to a 45-year-old Taliban man, and they have not seen her since that time. And just recently, they met with us, and they asked us, uh, is there any way that you could possibly get our daughter back to us? And we have done things like this before. Um, a little over a year ago, uh, we have safe houses all throughout Afghanistan. And guys, one of the things that we did when Afghanistan collapsed, there were people that went in and actually stole passport machines and the blanks to the passports and stuff. And we were able to get a hold of them so we could make our own passports uh, to get people out of the country. We had them in different locations. We call it redundant uh, because if one location gets burned, you don't lose the whole network. And people in our network did not know who each other was. And one of them did get burned. And so, uh, but we had a situation where we had about 20 people that were in a safe house. And I got a call one night. It was probably about uh, 8 o'clock in the evening. I don't remember exactly. And they told me that they thought that one of the safe houses might have been burned. And they were asking what we should do. Now, at that time, I was literally on the phone with people who were in the CIA, uh, the DIA, which is the Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, Blackwater State Department, FBI, uh, many different organizations. And truthfully, everybody that was on the phone with me was probably more intelligent than I was and had a lot more experience in this part of the world. I, I'd been in the war in Sudan for the last 27 years, but I had never been to Afghanistan before this happened. <clears throat> and as we talked about it, literally the whole consensus came together that we should leave them. They didn't think it was burned. They thought it was safe. 
Well, what do you do when God's put you in leadership? You pray. And, and I prayed, and as I prayed and I sought the Lord, I had this real sense of doom or dread. And I said, guys, I know that everybody thinks they're safe, but I don't have a peace in my spirit. So we're going to have to launch an operation tonight. Uh, we can't wait 24 hours. We're going to launch the operation. Now, this is very expensive for us because I have to hire foreign mercenaries. Uh, we use a lot of Pakistani mercenaries because they blend in. And, uh, you know, you have to get them in the middle of the night. And where these people were at, uh, after the sun goes down, you're not supposed to be on the street. The only body that's on the streets at night are Taliban soldiers. And there's myriads of checkpoints all over the city, and they move them all the time just to try to catch people. And uh, we had small children that we had to move, and a small child can begin crying during the night, so we actually tell them, medicate the children, put them to sleep. Uh, it was merciful for the children, and uh, we got the team assembled, and it was very high in dollars. I think we probably spent forty or $50,000 just for this one operation. And I said to the guys, I said, listen, um, we're going to go in probably about 2 o'clock in the morning. We're going to move them all at once. I don't want to take a chance. And we knew that if we encountered the Taliban, it would be a gun battle to the death. Uh, if you surrender, they will utterly torture you to death. Guys, it's very common for them to light people in fire, pour gasoline on them. Uh, they do a lot of extremely terrible things, much of what we've seen Hamas doing in the last uh, few weeks, what they did. It was the same type of stuff. And so uh, our guys rolled in about 2 o'clock in the morning, and we quickly gathered the 20 members in this safe house, and we put them in our vehicles, and then we had to go throughout the streets of this city and finally, we got to our next location, and when we got them there, we dropped them off, and then all of our people had to disappear before the sun rose, and we did accomplish that. Well, during the night, the Taliban had also been planning, and the next morning when the sun rose, all of a sudden, all these Taliban vehicles come rushing in to the neighborhood. Dozens of soldiers jump out, all carrying machine guns. They break down the doors. They rush the house, but nobody was there. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is that a lot of believers don't be really think that God can use them. Guys, I don't have the wisdom to run an operation in Afghanistan. Now, I have a lot of good people around me. But when God calls you, he expects you to do the ministry. And he doesn't want you to hand it off to someone else. And I think about Moses in particular. Uh, you know, when God gave him the call to do it, I'm going to read to you in uh, Exodus chapter 3, it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it, was not, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I should go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. As Moses said, here am I. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off the sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. And he goes on to tell Moses he's calling him to go to Pharaoh. And guys, as you read the story, Moses doesn't want the job. And he starts making up excuses, and God keeps telling him the reasons why he wants him to go. And my point in this is that when God calls you to do a ministry, you don't have to have all the gifts for it. A lot of time, it's on-the-job training. But also, the very act of faith, the very act of trusting the Lord moves the hand of God very powerfully. I, I've seen it over and over. You know, um, yesterday I was at Hogue Hospital. A good friend of mine is dying of cancer there. A very dear brother, uh, loves the Lord. And this is a Christian family, guys. And when I went into that hospital and someone's dying, you know how very downcast and depressing it can be, but I actually left that hospital lifted up by the way that this family behaved because he would cry out and say, help me, Lord Jesus, help me, I'm in so much pain. And this whole family would come together, they would lay hands on him and they'd pray for him and the pain would go away. And 
one of his daughters I thought was very special. Uh, she went up and laid hands on him because they're giving him drugs to deal with the pain also. And he's hallucinating. And she'd say, Lord, we just pray that you take control of his mind, that he would not hallucinate anymore, that he would be coherent, and his coherency would come back. And guys, what I want to share with you is that we do serve a very powerful God. And I think that there's a misunderstanding. People look at people in leadership, and they see us as a very much different class. You know, one of the things that I hate hearing sometimes, and people might think, well, why would you hate this, is someone will talk about doing something for the Lord, and they'll give something that we've done in our ministry as an example. And people will say, well, that was Wes Bentley, meaning that, well, yeah, he's a soldier, he could do it, but I'm a normal, I work at a grocery store. Well, guys, without, without Jesus Christ, we're all frail. And truthfully, it's through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, through seeking God, through asking for wisdom. And I have learned over and over in my life, when I don't know what to do, the Bible tells me, it says, be still. The Bible says, in everything with prayer and supplication, make your petitions known to God, and the God of peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And I really experienced that in my life where the Lord has given me supernatural wisdom and also had to make the call for many of the teams. I remember that the first time we went into Afghanistan, you know, I had about uh, seven or eight SEALs with me. I had three Marines, uh, and we had other people that were uh, helping us, CIA and DIA. And I asked the guys, I said, guys, what are we going to do if we run into the Taliban and they're raping women and children and they're killing them, are we going to intervene? And rightfully so, the guys said, you know, Wes, we just need to let it go. It's the difference of saving a few or different of saving thousands. And we just, we're, we just can't do anything. And again, guys, this is why it's important to have a proper moral compass because to think that if I don't do something now, that those others won't get saved. How about we save these and then trust the Lord to save the others? And I finally just said to the guys, I said, guys, I, I, if we run into this situation and we find men killing women and children and raping people, I said, I'm just going to start dropping them. And you guys better come with me because I paid for the trip, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> and unfortunately, they agreed to do it. Um, well, guys, uh, pray for us because uh, we're, we're planning to launch an operation to get this little girl back. There are a lot of problems with this operation. One, she's given birth since she's been with this guy over the last probably a year and a half. And, you know, we cannot inform her ahead of time. She's a child. Uh, I don't think she could handle the knowledge. Uh, we have ideas possibly even negotiating and paying for the girl. But most likely we will have to go in there and get her at night time. And we've done it before. We had an eight-year-old little girl that was taken. I can't go into the details, but we went in and we rescued her. And God is doing a lot of things like that. You know, guys, I, I believe in the supernatural. I believe that God can speak to us in miraculous ways. Uh, one of the criticisms that we get in our ministry a lot, and it comes from pastors. Now, they're not people that have served with us. There are people that have never been. But people say, Far-reaching ministries is just so over the top. They, uh, I mean, everything they do is just radical. They don't do anything normal, you know. Well, if you're going to go out there and save lives, sometimes you have to allow the Lord to give you a radical vision. Guys, I flew into Afghanistan last year, and I was flying in on Turkish Airline. And as I'm flying in on the plane, I'm actually praying about the operation because it's quite dangerous. You can easily get killed. I remember that at one point, we were within 50 yards of the Taliban. Our guys had our, our sights. We were trained on them. Now, we were not there to be seen. We were there to be unseen. We didn't want them to know. Had they seen us, we would have had a gun battle. They never saw us, so we did not have to engage them. But I'm flying into Afghanistan, and I'm praying. And I said, and, and I just get this impression from the Lord. And God has done this a lot in my life. And I felt like the Lord said, Wes, I want you to start an organization like Interpol, but to rescue believers in the last days. And guys, Interpol is an international crime fate, uh, fighting agency that works with many governments. The Lord was just trying to give me an image so that I could understand it in my brain. And so I get into the mountains. I'm up there with Brent. Brent's on my staff. Brent is a brilliant young man, uh, very intelligent. He was in Second Force Recon, which is the lead of the Marine Corps Special Forces. And... Uh, we're up in the Afghan mountains. We have our sniper rifles with us. And again, we're looking for escape routes. 
I have told Brent nothing. I have not talked to a single person on my staff. My wife was on the airplane with me at the time. She went off to help women in refugee camps. I had not even told Vicki what I was thinking of doing. And as we're in the mountains, Brent starts to talk to me. And he said, you know, brother, he goes, have you ever thought about starting an organization like Interpol, but to rescue Christians in the last days? I said, well, I am now. And uh, so, guys, I called Luke. Luke's on my staff. Luke was 14 years in the Marine Corps Special Forces. Luke speaks probably seven or eight languages. He's tested at genius level. And he was 22 years in the FBI. And I said, Luke, what do you think about this? And he said, brother, that's all I've done for the last 22 years. And he said, within the CIA, within all these organizations in our government, there are many believers that believe that we need stuff like this. And guys, it's not just Afghanistan for us. Uh, we have been involved in the Ukraine. Uh, our chaplains, we've been training the Ukrainian, Ukrainian chaplains for over a year. I'll be going back the first of the year to see them again. And uh, among the Ukrainian chaplains, uh, they have been going into these cities that are under Russian control. And they've been rescuing widows and orphans, many of them. I would say that they rescued well over 500, but we have not really kept track of it. Another thing that happened was I got a call um, when many of you may not be aware, but there's a war going on in northern Sudan, not southern Sudan. They're two different countries. There's a paramilitary go uh, group, uh, kind of like the Palace Guard, and then there is the army, and they are fighting for power in that country right now. When that war broke out, Within 48 hours, I had 30 organizations that were not associated with Calvary Chapel call us and ask us to help people get out. Within 48 hours, we had boots on the ground. A lot of the private contractors I used in Afghanistan and Ukraine, we, we got them in there very, very quickly. Uh, the U.S. Embassy was surrounded by rev rebels, so the United States sent in Delta Force to get them out. And they went in, and they went in the embassy but they left four teenage girls behind. Uh, and the rebel group was on one block. There was a block in the middle that was untouched. And on the other side was the army. And they were fighting across with each other like this. And the four teenage girls were in there. There was also a family, I believe, from uh, Paraguay. They were missionaries. And uh, so we were able to go in there and extract those four girls and that missionary family and also get them out of there. You know, it's really interesting when you serve God, how God does things. Um, many of you might be familiar with uh, Project Dynamo. They're on Fox News a lot. They do a lot of the same kind of stuff we do. They rescue, but they're not a Christian organization. And Brent told me that the director of that said, if you guys ever want to use my name as a recommendation, I will recommend you. You're the only organization that I would do that for. Uh, right after that happened, I, we literally got a call from... I know this sounds bizarre, but two different Christian groups, they're kind of, like, kind of like private contractors or Christians. They go into bad places to help Christians. And then uh, uh, some other groups that I can't name. And they literally called us and said, would you guys consider starting an organization to be a covering for all of us? You'll be the covering, but you can send us out on operations to rescue all these people. And we have rescued probably three, 400 people out of cartoon alone. We're still in operations on that also. Uh, we're going to call the organization Dreadnought. Dreadnought is the name of a World War I battleship, and what it means is fears nothing. Uh, and it's going to be called Dreadnought Jehovah, Jehovah Sabbat, which basically means the he armies of heaven fear nothing. Because, guys, we're not acting in our own wisdom. We're acting with the understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting Him. Now, guys, when Ukraine broke out, I won't go into all the details, but uh, about the second month of the war, we were feeding 15,000 people a month. Recently, they haven't needed the food, so we've stopped the program. We may have to take it up again, but for a long time, we were doing it. Last year, maybe in the last one and a half years, we built over 200 homes for uh, elderly people who have had their homes destroyed. A lot of the elderly have been committing suicide because their homes destroyed, uh, they don't have any family that cares for them. They're not getting their pigeon. They, they, they're too, too old to start over in life. So we've been coming in and taking care of these grandmothers. We had a situation, and guys, I was a professional shooter when I was in the Marine Corps. And uh, 
You know, I do a lot of hunting. I, I'm not one of those guys that goes out hunting just to shoot animals for the love of it. I, I truthfully don't like killing things. Uh, I do it because we hunt for meat and we hunt to feed people. But whenever I fire my rifle, I never miss. And, uh, you know, I kill everything on the first shot. And uh, I can tell you that as a soldier, uh, when we go out on these trips, most guys use these high-powered scopes. Well, I tend to use the iron sights, and I still kill it on the first shot. But one of the things I want to tell you that the, both of these women, one was a mother and her daughter. Now, the daughter was 40 years old, but she was very mentally handicapped. Uh, she really was only about six years old, mature-wise. And they had gone on the run for two weeks. And both of them were shot during that time. Now, guys, I can tell you as a professional show, soldier, I've seen a lot of war, a lot of combat. I've had 71 of my staff killed in the war in southern Sudan, saving other people's lives. Even at 500 yards, I can tell the difference between a soldier and a woman. Unless you're just about blind, so whoever shot them knew what they were doing. Well, we got the, uh, one of the great things was is that uh, people from Calvary Chapel in the Ukraine found this family, and we started taking care of the mother and the daughter. We found out that the mother has two extremely large tumors in her body. Whether she will make it or not, guys, we don't know yet. But we purchased an apartment for them, which right now they're very expensive because of the war, uh, and they are thrilled to death. It, both of them have come to faith in Christ, and the mother is telling everybody about Jesus because of the love that she feels. It's, it's really been a, a really sweet thing. But I sat down with the mother, and I said, I want you to understand something. We're going to take care of your daughter. Now, we think you'll be okay. We're, gonna, we're praying that you're going to come through this. But should you not, we will make sure that she lives with a Christian family that will actually love her, take care of her, and watch over her. We will provide for her needs. She'll always have a roof over her head. She'll have heat during the winter, electricity and water. There will always be a meal at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And we will make sure your child is loved. And see, if I were a parent and I had a handicapped child and I had no money and I was dying and I had no extended family, the most important thing in my life would be to find someone to take care of my child. And guys, what changes the world for Jesus is when people see God's love coming through us. You know, one of the things that I loved about the guys we we're serving with and <clears throat> the SEALs, the Special Forces Marines, all of them, by the world standards, have great boasting rights to talk about their military achievements. But none of those guys boasted about that. They boasted in the Lord. It was the Lord did this, the Lord did that. And I really loved working with them. Matter of fact, we've all become really quite close friends. And guys, I really believe that God has just called us to go into this world and really show people love. In Afghanistan, where we have our safe houses, we're having Bible studies every day with all the non-believers. And they're coming to Christ right and left. And one of the things that they keep asking us, why do you care for us? See, because in Islam, Islam kills everybody. <clears throat> Most of them hate Islam. <clears throat> they won't tell you that because they're afraid you'll kill them. But they hate it. And yet, because they see the love of Jesus Christ, they're coming to know Christ. This mother and her daughter have come, both come to know Christ. <clears throat> and God is working in a miraculous way over there. You know, guys, the Lord has many ways of getting a hold of us. And I want to share with you that um, I flew into Amsterdam Last, not this April, but the previous one. Uh, and on April 6th of the previous year, I had a dream. And guys, I want to be very, very clear. This was a dream. I have walked with the Lord for 47 years. I have never backslidden. Once I tasted Christ, there was nothing in the world that I ever wanted again. And guys, when I was in the Marine Corps, you know, I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam. The war ended before I could get over there. So I decided to get out of the Marine Corps and go and become a soldier of fortune or a mercenary. Fortunately, Christ got a hold of my life, and it changed everything about me. But what I'm saying is that what attracted me so much was the love that I saw through these people and how they be behave. The Christians were so much different, and I want to encourage you guys to really learn to shine for Christ. You know, the Bible says I'd rather you be hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. It's almost better if you're a lukewarm Christian not to share your faith. 
because people see the compromise. They see that you're not truthful, and it's not a good witness for the kingdom. And if you can't behave the way you're supposed to behave as a believer, it's probably better to be quiet. But the best thing to do is just get right with the Lord. Now, in sharing this with you in the Ukraine, I had this dream, and I believe that the Lord used the fact that I'm a soldier to get my attention. Guys, when I have dreams, I never remember them. I mean, I may remember just a tidbit, but I lose it immediately. I can remember every part of my dream. I have walked with the Lord for 47 years, and I've only had three dreams. One that I'm positive was from the Lord, two that I think were from the Lord. This one here, I can remember everything that I saw. In the dream, I was looking for a Calvary Chapel pastor that had gone missing in the Ukraine. And I got to a certain city, and I asked if he was there, and they said, no. But they told me there's a sniper, and he's killing a lot of civilians. Well, I was a professional shooter. I said, guys, I know how to deal with this, and I'll do it. And I did. I took the guy out. And I continued to looking for this pastor, and I got to another city. And once again, I asked, is he here? And they said, no, but there's a sniper in a high-rise building, and he's killing a lot of us. And I said, well, I'll deal with it. And they said, Wes, you don't understand. They said, uh, every time we get close to the building, he takes one of us out. So, you know, uh, we can't even get close to the building. I said, don't worry, guys. I know how to deal with it. In my dream, I entered the building with another sniper, and I remember saying to him, I'm going to take the lead, but you need to watch, because if we miss him, he'll come up behind us and he'll smoke us. So you need to be careful. And we started going up floor by floor, and I got up around the 17th or 18th floor, and I rounded the corner, and it was an apartment complex. There was a large hallway, and there was plastic sheeting and, plas and loose carpet on the floor, and it was moving. Well, I immediately raised my weapon to fire because I thought there was a sniper there. But the Lord told me, don't shoot. So I walked over very slowly. I kept my weapon trained on it. And I reached down and pulled back the carpet to see what was moving. And under it were four little boys, uh, all between the ages of probably about three and five years of age. And they were so afraid. And I looked at the boys and I said, where are your parents? And they go, we don't know. And I said, do you boys want to come home and live with me? And guys, they just got up and they came and they put their arms around my leg. And I woke up. It was 4.30 in the morning. And I had tears coming out of my eyes. I have never, in my, I can never remember ever in my life waking up with tears in my eyes. My Vicky, wife, Vicky, had got up at 3.30. She was studying the word. And she was shocked. She goes, honey, I have, I've never seen you cry. What, what is going on? And it took me a while to compose myself because it was so real. And I retold her the dream, and I said, Vicki, I feel like this is from the Lord. Are those boys out there, and I'm supposed to find them? And, and, and guys, the last time I cried was probably 40, 45 years ago. I was at in and out Hamburger down in Garden Grove, and when I left, there was an extra cheeseburger in the bag. <laughs> I still get a little emotional when I think about that. <laughs> but... Truthfully, guys, we did get an interpretation. All over the Ukraine, parents went out to get firewood, food, fuel, and they didn't come back. In this last year and a half, we've got two new orphanages in Ukraine, and the criminal gangs are abducting women and children and daughters especially and selling them into the sex trade. And I believe that God has called us to come along and protect these people. Guys, one of the criticisms, like I said, we get is that we're just so far out. So one of the things that I've begun to do is take pastors with me. I mean, I've always taken pastors, but pastors who really need to see. I remember Don McClure. Don McClure and Gene are very dear friends to Vicki and I. We've become very close. But Don told me, he said, you know, Wes, the first two years I knew you, I didn't like you. He goes, I thought you were lying. He said, who does this kind of stuff? And he goes, and then I went overseas and I saw that you hadn't even told me half of it. But I'm going to take a turn here, guys, and please understand. In Central and South America, and we got referred to this through Pastor Joe Foch from Philadelphia. I had no intention of starting another work. We are involved in four wars plus now fighting the cartels. And we went down there and what we found out is the criminal gangs are selling children into the sex trade. And parents are also selling their children in the sex trade. We have an orphanage down there. I have a three-year-old that needs reconstructive surgery on the front and the back 
from all the rape this child has been through. I have a nine-year-old that told me when she was five or six years of age that her father would bring home five or six men a night to watch her shower. And then when they were finished, these men would sodomize this child. And she said it was so painful that she would pass out. But this is what happened when people are given over to depravity. Instead of saying, what am I doing? They would splash her with water, wake her up, and do it again. Well, guys, I brought a bunch of pastors in because I wanted them to know the truth. And we went up to an area in this country, and I can't disclose it for security reasons. There's a river where they traffic these children. We had two federal law enforcement officers. They were in there to see and witness what we were sharing. And we actually videoed this exchange here. Shortly after we, they, they get there, a predator comes up. He thinks we're there for the kids. He offers us eight little girls, eight girls, all five years and old, younger. He promises they're all virgins. And he says, I have a place down here, there's a waterfall. You could go down and spend as much time as you want. Nobody will hear the screams. And then one of the law enforcement officers wants to find out how far this guy will go with it. And so he says, but they'll see our faces. And he goes, he, the, the guy goes, people drown here all the time and the river is full of crocodiles. So what he was saying for about $300 a child, he would let you rape them, he would drown them, and the crocodiles would remove the evidence. And this is one of the reasons we're gonna start this organization, guys, to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. We really believe that God has called us to do this. We're gonna show you a video here, guys, and as you get ready to watch this video, this is one of our orphanages. All of these children have been abused. You can see in their eyes, some of them have seen things they should not have seen. But we want you to see the hope of what happens when we get them. Let's go ahead and show that, guys.
guys, can you bring up the picture of the, of the little girl? You know, guys, um, God gives people different ways. And uh, what we learn to do is we learn to work within our gift. You know, I have been offered to pastor churches in my life before, large churches. And if the Lord ever speaks to me and tells me to do that, I will. But I recognize that I'm really more of a soldier than I am anything. You know, I really didn't even want to get involved down in South America. I mean, I wanted to be involved by doing the, our ministry doing the work. But I told my wife, Vicki, I said, honey, I'll let Brute, Brent handle it, Luke, Dave, Zavala, the other guys, Edward Amaya. You know, I'll work on Afghanistan and Ukraine. I'm a soldier. I'm used to war. It, it's better for me. But she would not let it go. And she kept saying, honey, I know the Lord wants you to go. Well, what changed everything for me when I got there was the little girl playing the piano. And guys, when I found out what happened to her, I couldn't imagine that a child could endure so much. If I could, I would adopt her. But you're not allowed to adopt children that have been abused from this country. Maybe that will change in the future. We had an orphanage down in Mexico for abused children. But it wasn't abuse from birth. It was abuse by parents. This little girl up there, Clara, that you just saw, we got her when she was three years old. Her father had been raping her from the time she was one. The first time I saw her, I've never seen a child so traumatized in my entire life. If a man would walk in the room, she would cry hysterically. And if in I remember that I, I just wondered, God, can you heal this child? But we prayed with her, we worked on her, and she became a very sweet little girl. We had another child in the orphanage that we always knew would die. Guys, she was very handicapped. And I remember that one night at about 2 o'clock in the morning, she just stopped breathing and went home to be with the Lord. Well, we had cameras all throughout our orphanage to protect the kids to make sure they weren't abused. Now, if they went to the bathroom or were showered, it was behind a curtain. You could not make out the child, but you could tell nothing was going on. And the police came in, we showed them the video, and uh, it was all over with. But there was a woman down there who was a prosecutor, and she thought this is her way to the top. So she accused the woman that ran the or orphanage of murder. And they came in and they took all of our children. We could not find them. It took months. And finally, I just set the staff down, and it eventually got to court, and thank God, there was a godly judge, and he, I, I, I hope she got fired, and she truthfully should go to prison, but he told the woman who pressed the charges, he goes, what did you do here? You can see very clearly in that video that that child died of natural causes. Why did you do this? And of course, she had no answer. But again, we still had the problem. I couldn't find Clara. And I finally got to my staff in Mexico, and I said, <clears throat> we're stopping all projects until we find her. If we scour Mexico from top to bottom, we're going to find that little girl. Finally, we found her. Good news was she was supposed to be with her grandmother, who was supposed to be a good woman. But guys, I knew that if she was there and her daughter was there, because the daughter knew this was going on, that the father would most be likely be there. So I called up Luke. Luke was in the FBI, I said, Luke, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going down there, and if he has touched her, at the very least, he'll be a paraplegic the rest of his life. That's the very least. And I almost thought Luke might say, hey, brother, you need to calm down, but he goes, Roger that, let's go. See, I forgot, Luke had been there with me the first time he saw the child, he had seen the terror. And see, there's this misunderstanding in Christianity, turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. It does not mean that we are supposed to allow children to be raped, murdered, and sold into the sex trade. As men of God, we have a God-given right to protect them. <laughs> you know, the good news, guys, is I've been praying a King David prayer, which was God, either have her father get saved or remove him from this earth. And what we've been told is he's now dead. And we're going to continue to take care of Clara. Um, no matter what she needs. I want to encourage you as a group of believers, 
The way that people come to Christ is by us showing God's love. Ministry should never be something to gain fame and fortune. It should never be something to become popular. We do it for one reason only, because we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, a couple years ago, or a few years ago, we were in a pretty bad battle. And there was a soldier that was shot on the battlefield. Two of my chaplains went out after the soldier. They grabbed him. They pulled him off the battlefield. In the process, they were both shot. And they died right after that. But see, the reason they went out there, they knew that they were eternally secure with Jesus Christ. They knew that absent from the body, present with the Lord. But they didn't know where this guy was. And so they chose to die that others might live, that he might have the chance to know the great love of Christ. This morning, what I want to share with you is that God doesn't want a piece of your heart. He doesn't want a part of it. He wants all of you. I know that many of you are believers and you love the Lord. But guys, there needs to be a point that we absolutely sell out. It doesn't mean that you go to the war zones. You have to be called. You have to be, that has to be your gifting. The men that I work with are all former soldiers. They're all trained for this. God created them that way. There's many different types of ministries, but it means that you come to this place that there's a defining moment in your life where it changes who you are. I know that when I got out of the Marine Corps, I got into corporate sales. And guys, I was making a lot of money. Probably today's dollars was the equivalent of two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars. Made a lot of money. I always had brand new tailored suits, drove nice cars, always carried around a wad of hundred dollar bills in my pocket. And where I worked, all the guys were like that. They all had a lot of money. Young twenty year old guy, twenty five, twenty seven, thirty year old guys were making a fortune. And I would share my faith, and I was well respected because I did share my faith. But I remember that one night I came home from work. And I prayed, and I said, Lord, I do not know where home is, but I want to come home. And what I meant is, Lord, I don't know where you're at, but I want to come to the place that you designed me to be, the place that you've called me in my life to be. I want my life to count for the gospel. And guys, the Lord wants that in your life too. We're going to have an altar call here, and I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. And guys, I want to say to the men, truthfully, one of the great problems we have in the world today is that nine out of every ten missionaries that goes to the field that we're getting are women. The men won't do the work. And they're scared to go into dangerous places, and the women go fearlessly into the dangerous places. See, as men, we're supposed to lead. You know, guys, one of the reasons the men in South Sudan respect me, and they consider me to be a general in their army. I do not, but if I go up to their headquarters, they call me general or commander. It's because I lead from the front. I don't sit behind a desk and send my men to fight. I go with my men to the battlefield, and I'm there to do the ministry with them, and it's so important that we do that.